Hello again. In our last lecture, which was our first lecture, we made reference to history as drama. If that analogy holds, it behooves us at this point to take a look at the stage. In the first instance, to examine the ultimate, the original stage, Africa's natural environment. Now, like so much else about Africa, the landscape itself has, has often been the, the stuff of, of stereotype. To an older generation such as, as my own, raised on Tarzan, raised on his numerous imitators on, on the TV screen, the landscape of Africa, the environment of Africa, could be summed up in one word. Jungle. What's Africa like? Well, it's jungle. Well, who lives there? The natives. What are they like? Oh, they're primitive. These things seem to be bound up in, in a whole uh, ball of, of stereotypical uh, mythology. Now, to younger uh, folks raised on the Discovery Channel, raised on, on Animal Planet, at least that's what you, you hope they're watching if, if you're a parent, um, Africa was, was endless grassland. I, I frequently find this perception among my, my young undergraduate uh, students. You know, this endless grassland where, in fact, uh, in terms of who lived there, it was mostly animals, where the beasts outnumbered uh, uh, the people, if, if you will. And finally, I just might mention uh, a third. To uh, a lot of people in the Western world, um, used to, inured to, what seemed to be constant tragic stories of, of hunger and, and famine and real enough stories, true enough stories, God knows. Africa may simply seem to be, to be barren, to be a, 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 a God-forsaken wasteland. Now, let's develop a more realistic appreciation in this lecture and the next, I think, of, of what is, in fact, an incredibly varied set of environments. And I, I intentionally pluralize that. Africa, first of all, has room for variety. The place to begin this discussion, it seems to me, is with the sheer size of the continent. There are a lot of ways to get at this. Africa is the second largest of the continents. It occupies something like 25%, about a quarter of the Earth's total land mass. Put it a little differently, Africa is three times the size of the continental United States. And to put it differently again, and perhaps internationalize it a bit, if we take Europe, China, India, Argentina, New Zealand, and the continental United States, Africa is larger than all of those combined, than all of Europe, all of China, India, Argentina, New Zealand, and the continental United States. Now, in many parts of Africa, this sense of, of, of vastness, of enormity, is, is almost palpable. It, it, it hits the, the visitor in particular. It can have the look and feel in a number of, of, of places in Africa of big sky country, rather like the American West. And that's an analogy that I'll return to in the following lecture when we get uh, a bit more specific. I'd like to suggest then that our sort of catchwords for today would be immensity and variety. Immensity and variety, room for a variety of quite different environments on this, this single uh, continent. Now, I think some feel for this immensity and variety can be drawn from an excerpt I'd like to read you from a book. Uh, it's a book called Venture to the Interior. It was written by uh, Lawrence Vanderpost, who uh, was a South African-born writer with a great many skills and a great many interests. Uh, he has written some well-known books, The Lost World of the Kalahari or Kalagati uh, Desert, etc. I later wrote a book uh, about the 
uh, the noted psychotherapist or psychological theorist uh, Carl uh, Jung. In 1949, van der Post, for reasons that don't concern us here, was commissioned by the, the British government to, to undertake a journey over a portion of what we could call South, uh, South Central Africa. He wound up in the modern day countries of Malawi and, and Zambia. And he wrote an account of it, which at one point I think conveys this feel of immensity and variety rather well to me. This is what Banner Post had to say. You'll notice, by the way, that he also uses my favorite uh, analogy here of, of drama, and also that he, he adds another, and that is a comparison of land, in this case, with the sea. Vanderpost. For it is a drama of great and absorbing interest, this continent of Africa, as we saw it that morning after the storm. It is a drama in the sense that the sea is one. I do not know of any country except perhaps the far interior of Asia, which is, in terms of earth, in terms of solid matter, so nearly the equivalent of the sea. There seems to be no end to it. One goes on for thousands of miles. One goes on until one's eyes and limbs ache with the sight and the bulk of it, dazzled by this inexhaustible repetition of desert, lake, escarpment, plateau, Plain, snow-capped mountain, plateau, plain, escarpment, lake, and desert again. And one almost thinks and hopes that there will be no more of it. But in the morning, across the next horizon, there is more. Now, for some, indeed, the scale of Africa and, and the great differences between its, its regions, these things defy any effort to, to generalize. Consider the, uh, the words of, of another writer, Reichard Kapuczynski. Now, Kapuczynski is a, is a Polish journalist by, by trade who has made a career of injecting himself into trouble spots. He is drawn to civil wars, uh, he's drawn to military coups and so forth uh, in Africa and in elsewhere. I, I read on the, the jacket of uh, his latest book that he's been uh, sentenced to, to death four times, uh, but still very much with it. In the foreword of that verb, very brief forward to his collection of short pieces uh, on Africa called Shadow of the Sun, Kapuczynski shows his frustration with his gener generalizations on Africa. He, he says, I'm not writing a book about it. I'm writing a book about some people from Africa whom I had encounters with. And I, I want to give you his, his own words. Again, you'll hear an analogy with the sea, but he adds a couple more in there, which increase the, the scale even more. The continent is too large to describe. It is a veritable ocean, a separate planet, a varied, immensely rich cosmos. Only the greatest simplification, only with the greatest simplification can we say Africa. In reality, except as a geographical Appalachian, Africa does not exist. Well, I, I hope that it does exist since it's my subject. I think I would amend perhaps Cappuccini uh, Kapuczynski's statement there to, to say maybe there's not one Africa, that there are many. So, let's look at some of them. Now, common sense in your own knowledge tells you, uh, as you know, that many factors go into the making of an environment. Factors like latitude, temperature, rainfall, elevation, soil type, topography, vegetation, all of these contribute, they combine in different ways to give us that useful generalization we are using of, of an environment or an ecological zone, if you like. What I'd like to do is to consider each of these kinds of factors and, and to make some basic statements about them in Africa, about elevation and rainfall and so forth. And then, in the second part of 
the lecture to combine them, indeed, in different ways, and come up with some categories of environment that I hope will be useful down the road. Now, you know, a, a phrase like tropical Africa practically rolls off the tongue. This, this may be wrapped up with the whole jungle thing. I, I, I'm not sure there. But tropical Africa, and indeed, technically speaking, most of Africa is tropical. It lies between the tropics of Cancer in the north, the tropic of Capricorn in the south. Most, but not all. In North Africa, it largely lies outside of our purview, but much, most of North, all of North Africa's coast with the Mediterranean lies north of the Tropic of Cancer. In South Africa, one of our key countries, the Republic of South Africa, modern-day South Africa, that country, lies almost entirely south of the Tropic of Capricorn. It's therefore in the temperate zone of the Southern Hemisphere uh, and, and not in the tropics. If you go to South Africa in the Southern Hemisphere's uh, winter, and of course that's the opposite of ours, in June or July, I mean, you'd best take some warm clothes, uh, or at best uh, you're going to uh, have to purchase them from the many women you'll see knitting quite heavy wool sweaters in June, July, August on the street corners of places like Johannesburg and, and, and Durban and, and Harare. It's quite possible to get not just snowfall, but blizzards in the Drakensberg Mountains of South Africa during those months. Now, I mentioned mountains, and of course that leads us to another of these key elements, and that is, is elevation. As we all know, elevation cuts. It, it counteracts the effect of latitude on, on temperature. So much so that places that lie directly on the equator or very near to it, if they're high enough, can indeed have permanent snow and ice packs. And two examples from our region, from our continent, are Mount Kenya, which lies almost exactly on the equator, but at 17,000 feet, permanently uh, glaciated at the, the top. Only three degrees south of the equator, the nearby peak, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, of course, Africa's highest mountain, Kilimanjaro, and again, permanent ice and snow uh, on those places. Now, even aside from these great mountains, if we're on Africa's high plateau, or I'm going to be non-French here and say plateaus when I'm speaking in the plural, but on these high plateaus of Africa, again, they're far cooler than one might think from, from the mere latitude lying in the, the tropics. And plateaus, we have. Um, I'm going to suggest um, an, an image here. If you went to your cupboard and took out a, a cereal bowl and then took that to a counter or a table and turned it, overturned it so that it was, it was lying upside down, you'd have a, a piece of ceramic or what have you that rises quite quickly from its edges and then flattens out, of course, across the the bottom. For a lot of the African continent, that image works fairly well, particularly not just southern Africa, but the whole southern half of the continent, really, as well as substantial portions elsewhere. Again, that works pretty well. What I mean is that from the ocean, the land mass tends to rise rather quickly and then tends to flatten out into these large plateau, which give us Africa's great, great plains. One effect of that is that in the southern half of the continent in particular, the great rivers, great as they are, I mean, the Congo River it carries more water to the sea than any, any river on earth, but they do not serve as conduits. They do not serve as avenues for communication or, or transportation into the interior. And the reason, of course, is that they fall over great rapids uh, on their way to the sea, they fall from these plateaux in the interior uh, to the, the low-lying coastal plains before reaching their mouths. Now, having said that about how elevation cuts the effects of, of being in the tropics, nonetheless, we are in the tropics. Much of Africa 
is tropical indeed, and it is warm year-round. Now, why do I emphasize that? Year-round warmth. I do so because that fact, along with another one, the uh, enormous age, the, the great longevity of the African land mass, of Africa's soils, and uh, originally the rocks from which those soils came from. These are among the oldest land uh, masses on Earth. The year-round warmth combined with the age of the African landmass means that Africa's soils have been exposed for a long time. Africa's soils are old, exposed, they are weathered, they are leached. The year-round warmth, the significance of that, is that the decomposition of organic matter does not take a break uh, in winter. You want some decomposition of organic matter. That's what provides so-called humus uh, in the soil. But if it continues, it breaks down completely and you're left with a, a relatively low fertility. Most of Africa's soils are indeed relatively poor. Only about 8% of, of Africa's land mass is cultivable. And only about 3% could really be described as fertile. Those areas tend to be in the volcanic, mountainous areas, uh, such as, as Ethiopia, the lower bases of Kilimanjaro, and, and so forth. Now, year-round warmth means something else. It means, of course, that this climate, these environments, where we have this year-round warmth, um, have a, a quite hospitable climate for microbes and the diseases that they can cause. Again, we don't get that break provided by a freeze in winter that one gets in more northerly or more southerly uh, climes. We can mention three of Africa's, I suppose we'd call them legendary, uh, diseases, uh, just for, for sake of illustration. Malaria, mosquito-borne as we all know, Malaria, almost certainly the greatest killer of Africa's children, particularly Africa's children under five. Yellow fever, also uh, mosquito-borne, and again, uh, a malady with a long uh, and damaging history uh, on the continent. And finally, I'll mention trypanosomiasis. That's a long word, but it, it's usually referred to as, as sleeping sickness. Now, there are two strains of this. There is a form of trypanosomiasis that can affect humans, and that's really where the popular name of sleeping sickness uh, comes from. Actually, trypanosomiasis, which is not carried by mosquitoes, but by a different insect, the tsetse fly, is actually far more devastating to, to animals, and in particular to, to livestock. And in that sense, it can be uh, debilitating not directly to humans, but limiting to humans' uh, economy, in the sense that where the tsetse fly is found, it's almost impossible to keep, for instance, the supreme domestic beast, and that is, is the cow, cattle. The relative poverty of soils and the virulence of disease has meant that life has been a struggle for many Africans, past and present. In a sense, it makes the long-haul mastering of the continent, if you will, by humankind, all the more impressive. And it may also help to explain why, even though humans emerged here first, why Africa's population growth has been relatively slow compared to the other continents. Now, back to our key elements for a moment, our key factors, okay? What about rainfall? Uh, water, obviously, is critical to all life. Yours, mine, plants, animals, etc. It's got to either come from above or come from below. Rainfall, uh, crucial certainly for, for most forms of Africa, most of Africa's uh, uh, agriculture is, is rain-fed. Uh, and, and therefore, absolutely essential for, for certain kinds of, 
uh, of life styles. Again, here's my generalization. Africa is a relatively dry place, as we'll see in just a minute. There are certainly exceptions to that, places with very heavy rainfall and, and so on. But in general, it is quite possible, it is a genuine question year after year in many parts of Africa, whether there will in fact be enough rainfall to sustain agricultural production, uh, etc. What rain there is, is often seasonal. That is, it is compressed into a, a, a period of a few months, four or five months, typically. These are caused by movements of the so-called intertropical convergence zone, which I won't attempt to, to explain. But in a place like Zambia, when people are looking skyward in, in November, it's for good reason. If it doesn't start in November, it's not going to have time enough to mature that crop of maize or what have you by the time it stops in, in April or early May. Seasonal rainfall. Now, combining these elements in different ways, let's do that then. I'm going to propose to you uh, a framework. I'm going to propose a typology. I'm going to suggest three primary or major kinds of African environments and then suggest some, some others, some, some secondary ones uh, as well. What are our three primary African environments? Well, the first one is indeed jungle, or more properly put, tropical rainforest. We certainly have it in Africa, although we certainly have far less of it than a lot of people assume, certainly than I would have assumed in my, in my earlier years. Well less than 10%, some would put it these days less than 5% of the African surface area covered by tropical uh, rainforest. A tropical rainforest, of course, we'll get a more detailed description of it next time from, a, from an authority on it, but, you know, it's dense, it's deep, it's very green, it's shaded, it's layered. There are whole worlds going on up there at the level between 90 and 120 feet in a tropical rainforest that very few humans are ever able to, to encounter. Now, rainforests are, have supported considerable populations uh, in African history, and not simply those who hunt and gather inside the forest, such as the well-known Ituri uh, pygmies of the, of the Congo rainforest, but agricultural populations as well. It's just good to note, I think, at this point, that the difficulty and the exertion of clearing rainforest in order to make space for either cropland or for, for pasture can be a limiting uh, feature. Now, a second of my three major environments would be desert. We all know, coming in, that the world's largest desert, the world's greatest desert, the Sahara, obviously dominates much of the northern half of, of the entire continent. Just in passing at this point, I would note that although the Sahara is the world's largest desert, it is also one of the world's youngest deserts. Only about 6,000 years ago or so, rivers flowed in what is now the Sahara. There was certainly considerable pastoralism, some argue that there was indeed cultivation. In fact, that this was one of the places where pastoral, pastoralism, livestock keeping, and cultivation actually began in, in Africa. Now, almost by definition, deserts, of course, support very low population densities. Um, one is either dependent on, on hunting and gathering or, at the very best, nomadic pastoralism, such as the Tuareg, a very tough people indeed of the Sahara in West Africa. Uh, practice. Now, beyond the Sahara, I, I put it this way. Think of the corners. One corner to look for desert is the so-called Horn of Africa. If you look at the map of Africa on the eastern Africa coast, you can see a protrusion of land, which, which looks a bit like a, a rhino's horn or what have you. This Horn of Africa dominated by the modern countries of Somalia, southern Ethiopia, Eritrea, northern Kenya. Again, very desert or semi-desert uh, conditions applying over much of that Horn of Africa. Now, the other corner I had in mind, that I've sort of catty-cornered, is the southwestern portion of the African continent. Here we can find two great deserts. One would be the Namib, which is a... This is a desert's desert. I mean, this is a desert with a capital D. You know, this is a desert of the, the real sand dunes and so forth. 
It runs in a, a fairly narrow strip along the, the West African coast, again, the southwestern African coast. And of course, from Namib it comes the, the, the name of the modern country of Namibia. Now, next door, a bit further east, and Africa's second largest desert would be the Kalagadi or Kalahari. It's the same word, it's just alternate uh, spellings. Dominating, again, most of the modern country of Botswana, Namibia, portions of the northern part of the Republic of South Africa. Now, the third of my primary environments, and this one I really want to emphasize, is savanna. High in elevation, gently rolling to flattish, alternately wooded and grassed. These are our plateaus. These are Africa's great, great plains. And again, the savanna is the place where we find seasonal rainfall almost the rule. Usually one rainy season, some variations on that in Kenya or East Africa, you'll find the short rains and long rains and so forth, but very definitely seasonal rainfall as a pattern. Now, the reason I emphasize it is because savanna environments, for our purposes, human history, our focus, have probably been the most important environment in the sense that savanna has probably been home to more people and to more people's history than any other single kind uh, of, of environment. Not only people, but it seems that states, kingdoms, empires flourish in savanna environments. Is that because of the, the openness of the country where agricultural people find it necessary to organize for defense against the possibility of relatively sudden attack? Some have theorized. Whatever the reason, as we'll see in, in subsequent lectures, savanna empires in West Africa have grown and flourished for something like 1,500 uh, years. The great African historian Jan van Sina, the book that made his name was one called Kingdoms of the Savannah. In other words, the political fact interacting with the, the environmental fact in a very different savanna belt running south of the, the great rain, rainforest of, of Central Africa. Okay. Now, in addition to these three major ecological zones, I'm going to suggest a few uh, what I've called secondary ones. Now, of course, there's nothing secondary to the people who are living around them. Uh, all, their lives are often dominated um, uh, by these, these features. The secondary environments, these additional environments I want to emphasize, are particularly affected by elevation or by proximity to, to water. The first one I would say is montane or mountainous. We, we've made some reference to it uh, already, encompassing both the kind of freestanding volcanic peaks like Kilimanjaro or major ranges like the Ruwenzori or Mountains of the Moon in, in Uganda, the Drakensberg Mountains of, of South Africa, Mount Cameroon in, in West Africa, the Futajalon Highlands, and of course the Ethiopian Highlands uh, of, of Northeast Africa. A second of these other environments, secondary environments that I would uh, emphasize would be lacustrine, which is a, a fancy way of saying lakeside. And people's lives obviously are affected by the resources, fish most, most obviously, that these lakes provide. East Africa's Great Lakes region, and we'll make reference to that at, at numerous junctures uh, in our subsequent uh, lectures, is certainly an example uh, of this. A third type, again, affected by proximity to water are river and or river valley uh, environments. And I don't have to tell you that this often is the dominating fact. I mean, we can't imagine ancient Egypt without the Nile. And peoples living along the Zambezi or the Congo or the Niger or what have you very much find their lives dominated uh, by that. Now, a point that many people have made, but it's worth emphasizing, is that, of course, rivers often wind up marking political boundaries between nations, etc., uh, in reality, of course, they, they more often, in actual history, attract people to them and therefore bring them together as opposed to serving as the barrier uh, between them. Now, finally, on these other environments, to say a place is, is coastal speaks for itself. All over the world, nearness to the sea has been a major determinant of economy and culture. Now, North Africa's Mediterranean coast, for instance, lies largely outside of our 
our purview in this course. But think the other end of the continent and almost exactly the same distance. If you look at the southern latitude at virtually the same latitude south as the Mediterranean shore of North Africa is north, we come, of course, to the Cape region of South Africa. And as we'll see in our next lecture, this is a very Mediterranean kind of environment, uh, indeed, dominated by the wheat, uh, the, the wines, etc. Now, in closing, I would emphasize one further point. And it's, again, perhaps one that's, that's obvious. Environments are not static. They, they change. They change both on their own, if you like, that is the endless and almost unimaginably long atmospheric and geological histories of the Earth have, of course, produced ice ages and desertifications, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, of course, humans change these environments as well. And I said in the first lecture that the interaction and the effects of, of humans on the environment would be one of our, our recurring themes. Now, we're not going to explore that at this moment, but I would just note in passing that things like desertification, like deforestation, like global warming, are having impacts with consequences on people's lives today. The Sahara Desert is, is expanding. It's young and it's still growing. The great rainforests of the central middle parts of Africa are shrinking, and that probably largely due to humankind's activities. Global warming has been associated with everything from floods in, in Mozambique to the uh, decrease in the, the glacial snowpack atop Kilimanjaro. All of these things, again, quite real consequences for people in Africa today. Okay, I hope in this lecture that we've established a framework, a series of stages, if you like, for the unfolding of this human history which will follow, and I hope it'll prove useful to us in our subsequent lectures. Thank you.